Hello, welcome. Hi. I'm Lynn Brockington, Community Experience Coordinator at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. So welcome to tonight's webinar. This webinar is part of Climate Future, an initiative that invites the community to come together and to deepen knowledge and take action around the climate crisis. And um, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that we're doing this webinar on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Squamish Nation, Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and Musqueam Nation. We recognize and respect them as nations in this territory, as well as their historic connection to the land and waters around them since time in memorial, and certainly before they were single-use plastics. So we're doing this webinar tonight with um, a local organization called For Our Kids. Um, Actually, I should say the local chapter of For Our Kids. For Our Kids is a network of grandparents and parents across Canada taking action on climate change. And uh, we're very happy tonight to be coordinating this, this uh, program with um, the local chapter, the North Shore chapter of For Our Kids. So I'd just like to ask Celine to, to come on and tell us a little bit more about that group. Hi. Hi, Celine. Hi, Lynn. Thank you, thank you for uh, having me and having the for our kids uh, for our kids North Shore chapter. Um, very quickly, who are we? Lynn gave a bit of an introduction. Um, each chapter is run locally and uh, uh, very much by volunteers doing taking actions on um, uh, topics that they feel are very relevant and helpful for their regions uh, in order to, to address climate change. Um, so we've taken actions on a number of issues, doing so with uh, meeting with our MLAs, publishing op-eds, we've been painting banners, lots of informal government uh, submissions and running speaker series. So this MIDI expert is a series that uh, we offer on a monthly basis to help people learn about environmental topics, to connect with local experts, and uh, most importantly, to uh, help them understand what they could do themselves. And um, I'll do a plug for the next session, actually, if you want to mark your calendars, that is on June 22nd, uh, we will have Ocean Ambassadors Canada coming with us. Uh, so that should be another exciting session next to uh, today's session. I'll put uh, later on our uh, um, details in the chat if you want to stay in touch with us or have any questions for, for our kids. Uh, but with that, I'll keep it very short. Uh, Karen has great stories to tell uh, us and uh, I'd like to, uh, to pass it over to uh, Karen to then get started with reduction of single-use items. Great, thank you so much Celine. Um, I'll just, Karen, I'll just say a few words about who you are before we get going and I'm also going to put up a poll just so that we can get um, an accurate attendance number. So um, Karen is um, a senior engineer with Solid Waste Services at Metro Vancouver, and um, she has worked on various waste reduction and recycling projects over the past 10 plus years, from feasibility studies on turning wood waste into particle board to implementing recycling programs in regional parks. So as the lead for the region single use item reduction work, it is Karen's job to research how we can reduce plastic waste through circular economy programs, policies, and business practices. So thank you so much, Karen, for um, taking some time tonight to, um, to join us. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. And um, whenever somebody wants to talk about waste and recycling with me, I'm always very excited. So if you have any questions, um, there will be questions at the end and I'm happy to answer all, all related questions. Um, and as you can see, uh, I have worked with the park and this is uh, a photo of when we worked with the parks on reducing waste. Um, and one of the key challenges they still have is the number of coffee cups in the waste stream. Um, and I'll just start a bit about myself um, before I get into the presentation. And, and I, like many of you, 
love the ocean. Um, growing up on the West Coast, I, I spent a lot of time in it as a kid, as a swimmer, and I've recently taken up kiteboarding. So I really love the water. And I just can't imagine a world where there's more plastic in the oceans than fish. And that's what researchers are concerned will happen by 2050 if we don't take action. So I'm really motivated by that. And, and for the for the past 10 years, I've uh, kind of dedicated my life towards reducing waste. Um, and part of the reason is because I read a book called Cradle to Cradle, and it really solidified for me that the biggest problems we have are, are about consumption of materials. And just to link it to climate, so Ellen MacArthur Foundation finds that 45% of the emissions globally are linked to the production of materials. And so this is something that I really got curious about. I thought, okay, we can solve the energy problem by um, switching to renewable sources of energy, but we really didn't have a clear path for how to manage all these materials that we consume on a daily basis. And so I'll spare you the details of the last um, 10 years of my work and cut to the chase. Um, the summary is that we are part of a very complex uh, system and this means that we're all connected, and it means that the decisions we make every day not only affect ourselves, but they affect the planet and every living being on the planet. And so um, what I do is try to make positive change towards reducing these materials um, by thinking about how we can change systems and uh, the first step I take, especially with single use items, was to kind of understand the problem. So in 2018, for the first time, we looked at just how many of these items are being disposed. So this doesn't include items being recycled, but in 2018, 1.1 billion single use items were disposed in the region. And we remeasured in 2020, and it's about the same, around a billion items. Um, the, the mix has changed due to the pandemic, but the number of items still remains quite high at 440 items per person. So as waste reduction experts, our goal is always to move up this, this triangle called the waste hierarchy. And we always try to move towards minimizing waste in the first place, as well as maximizing reuse and recycling is important and recovering energy is important and responsibly disposing of waste is important, but the most powerful thing we can do is to minimize waste in the first place and to maximize reuse. And so that's where we'll focus today. And so that's definitely, a, this triangle is definitely the perspective of a, of a solid waste management um, professional, but I think when we talk to people, what they told us as to why they want to reduce single-use items and single-use plastics is because they want to protect our oceans and they want to protect our marine life. And they've all seen this photo on the internet through their social media or however they get their information and they just really want to try to change this. And they're not the only ones. Um, many levels of government are recognizing that this is a challenge and that they need to take action. And so at the Canadian um, government level, so the federal government working on some regulatory measures to ban single-use plastics by the end of 2021, they will release what their plan is. So not sure when they'll implement those measures, but they plan to tell us what they will be by the end of this year. Um, the Province of BC is also working on measures to reduce single use items. They've increased the number of items that will be accepted in residential recycling by 2023. They've also worked to approve municipal bylaws. So you may have heard that some local jurisdictions like City of Vancouver have bylaws that are in place or pending to reduce single use items. And they're also working on um, looking at if they should do bans at a provincial level. And many of our members in the Lower Mainland and throughout B and communities throughout BC have um, programs and policies in place to reduce single-use items. And so as an employee of Metro Vancouver, I work for um, the regional government 
and we kind of provide a central role of coordination and support for all of our member communities. And so we've completed a toolkit. Uh, we do a lot of research and I'm gonna, I've presented some of our numbers, but I'm gonna present more because I, I love research. Um, and we continue to monitor how we're doing, provide education. Um, and we also just got approval um, to work on a bylaw standard. So there's been some concerns that every community has a different approach to reducing single use items. Um, so we're going to be working with all the communities in our region to try to come up with a harmonized approach so it's less confusing for citizens and businesses uh, when they go to be part of the solution and implement uh, single use item reduction measures. So before I get into um, single use item reduction, I have to answer the question that everyone asks me, which is, well, why can't we just recycle everything? Um, what's wrong with that? And, and definitely recycling is important and we should do it, but there's many challenges um, with recycling. And so firstly, I wanna say you should always recycle and you should recycle with confidence in BC because we have really great programs and a lot of our material is recycled. But for example, um, what I call plastic lined hot paper cups, are unique to BC. So these switching, um, sorry, what I call plastic lined hot paper cups or what everyone else calls coffee cups are very commonly disposed. And while there is a recycling program for it, it's unique to BC. So these can be recycled in the local BC recycling program, but that's not common. Um, they're very hard to recycle in most jurisdictions. So just swapping um, plastic out for paper causes other environmental challenges. Um, and often people don't even realize that their paper cups are actually lined with plastic. And the other thing that they don't realize is that some of their paper wrappings that they get their food in actually have a coating on them that makes it grease proof. And so if you have an item and the grease and the water doesn't go through it, then it's likely that it either has a plastic coating like the coffee cup, or it has a, um, oops, I messed up my slides. Or it, or it has something called a PFAF coating, which everyone else thinks of as like the same coating you have on your non-stick pan or the same coating you have on your glide floss or the same coating that you have on um, say your waterproof jacket. And the problem with these coatings is that um, it makes it so they're very hard to compost because these are persistent synthetic chemicals which have been associated with various health concerns. And so, um, for us as waste managers, it's very tricky for us to explain to people what can and cannot go in the compost bin, especially if it's paper-based. So we just say if the grease and water doesn't go through it um, to be safe, put it in the garbage or if it can be, put it in the recycling like for the coffee cups. Um, and the similar challenges come with plastics and compostable plastics. I know some people have really focused on switching to compostable plastics, but they bring their own challenge. And the reason I'm sharing this slide is because many people don't realize that um, plastics labeled compostable can A, both be fossil-based, so that's these types of bioplastics. They can be bio-based, so made from plants. And the same with conventional plastics. So the landscapes of plastics out there is actually quite complex and makes it um, very possible, but very complicated for us to uh, manage. And I'll get into some of the challenges with the bioplastics in a second, but um, with the regular plastics, it's very interesting when you put them in your recycling bin, there's optical sorters that identify what they are and put them into the correct bin. And there's really good markets for most of them, but if you put your bioplastics into the recycling bin, uh, there's no recycling markets for that at that this time, even though they're technically recyclable. So the only thing that can go into the recycling is just the regular conventional 
plastics, not the not the compostable plastics. So you can put the plastics made from biomass that are chemically made into the same plastic as the as the fossil based ones, but you can't put the ones that are labeled compostable or biodegradable in the recycling. So it can be quite complex um, to figure out even what to do with the plastics. But if you have any questions, we're here to help. And so is RCBC. So you can always call or email the RCBC hotline. So to make it less confusing, we just kind of explain to people that um, you know, when you're looking at where to put your compostable plastics, they actually go in the garbage since they don't go in the recycling stream. And as you can see on this slide, they also don't go in the green bin. And that's because um, only very specific materials can be processed by our local composters. And most of the plastics out there, even if they're labeled biodegradable or compostable, aren't easily composted by our local facilities and they end up getting a whole bunch of different ones can't tell which ones they are and so sometimes they have to screen them out and send it all to the garbage because they're not sure what's what so um just for completeness i don't want to leave you to think like oh occasionally i need a single use item and i don't know what to do um, so I just want to share with you my approach. If you do need to purchase single use items for a party, I would encourage you first to consider reuse instead. If you can manage that, that's always the best. Oh, I'm having problems with my. OK, and then if you can't um, go with reuse, then a regular plastic with recycled content is great that really helps stimulate the recycling market for plastics so that they're more likely to be properly managed and um, for sure make sure whatever you do choose is accepted in our local recycling programs um, that way it can whether people recycle it at your event or take it home there's definitely a place for it to go instead of the garbage but overall the least confusing thing is Reuse. So reuse is always better. Um, it's quite simple. You bring your cup for a contactless pour if your cafe will allow you. Um, and then you just keep reusing that cup and you keep um, it forever. So this is actually my coffee cup at my local um, coffee shop. And I think just myself, I've reduced uh, about 400 coffee cups since the pandemic started because my coffee shop has allowed me to continue to uh, bring my cup for safe contact free pours. You can see she's not, I just put my cup on the counter, they pour the shot and the milk in it, and then I take it away and they never touch my cup. Um, so that works really well. And we're seeing more and more businesses come into this space. So we're seeing things like Reusables.com started a pilot in Vancouver, and you can see in the top left here, there's, and we've seen Cuppy, where they are looking also to provide reusable coffee cups, um, along with Shareware, they're looking at doing an office program, so get in touch with them if you think your office would like uh, to be part of a program. Uh, we've had Tom from Loop present at our Zero Waste Conference that we do every year, and he said people are getting on board with getting, for example, their ice cream in a reusable container, and not necessarily just because they want to save the environment, but because they like the functionality and the design features of the reusable containers. So this is a little bit new, but people are getting on board and they like it. And what Metro Vancouver um, is working on to encourage people to bring reuse is our new Super Habits campaign that we just launched on May 31st. And that's my background. Now you know why I have this background with me today. And, um, you know, this is bringing our own bags, refusing straws if we don't need them for accessibility re reasons, bringing our own utensils, 
using a reusable container. There's some restrictions around that right now, but you can still put your leftovers. If you go to a restaurant, you can put them in your reusable container that you bring. And as I described already, you can bring your own mug. So there's all these simple everyday habits that we think are pretty super that can help save the day. And I just wanted to share some examples. So this is me with my first burrito delivered by DoorDash um, as part of the Reusable.com's pilot. So that <laughs> I, I um, don't have many friends left on Facebook, but some of them still follow me and all my crazy zero waste habits. <laughs> Uh, and this is just a close up. So before I had to recycle this plastic and now I can um, just have a reusable container that I rinse and then bring back to the local store and then they give me a new one if I want more, uh, more food, they give me a fresh one that's clean and sanitized and safe. Um, I also get my essentials from a refill grocery store. Um, and I think that's a pretty cool thing to try out if you haven't tried it. Um, this is my contactless coffee cup pour. And the other thing I try to do, um, which, which uh, according to our campaign is pretty super, is I try to get rid of all these um, kombucha. That's a fermented tea drink. It's non-alcoholic, but it's quite delicious and fizzy if you've never tried it. And I get it refilled at my local um, brewery. They they have beer, but I don't drink the beer. I just drink the kombucha. And they have a growler exchange program. So every time I go there um, and fill my kombucha up, I get a different growler, which I think is pretty great. So it's always good to ask local businesses if they have these programs so you can participate in them. And I encourage you all also to go to our campaign, which is now available at www.superhabits.ca and get recognition for all of the wonderful things you do. And if you have super habits um, that you would like to share with the group, I encourage you to put them in the chat along with your questions. Um, and yeah, so now I'll just leave it with you. What's your super habit? Thank you, Karen. That was great. Nice and quick. Oh, my goodness. Um, but there has been a lot of comments in the Q&A in the chat. And I think what I'm going to do is I'll start with the Q&A. Um, and I'm going to kind of zero in on the questions rather than the comments that are, that are posted here. So there have been a lot of um, questions just regarding using reusable containers, uh, because of course, during COVID, um, some places were just saying, no, sorry, not filling that coffee cup. You have to use one of our disposables. And that seems to have been this similar with takeout food. So just in terms of the kind of provincial laws right now and the health laws, can, can restaurants, can they use them now again? Can coffee shops fill your cup? Yeah, so <laughs> there was a short period of time when, um, the advice from the provincial health officer was not to accept cups and not to accept bags at the grocery store, but that changed um, during the pandemic. And now if if your coffee shop does allow it, you can bring your own, or sorry, if, if your coffee shop does allow it, you can um, bring your own cup. And most of the coffee shops that I've seen allow it do what I demonstrated in, in my photos, which is they you put your coffee cup down and they never touch it, they just fill it. So the, the we, you know, the, the latte art hasn't been as um, beautiful and I think that bothers my barista, but I try to encourage them by saying that they're now becoming very like abstract artists. And like one of them's actually getting pretty good. He can still do like hearts and things, even though he's not <laughs> holding the mug. <laughs> wow, um, but that's it, impressive. But it, you know, it's about um, chatting with your local um lo like so for me it's a it's a local coffee shop and i've got to know the baristas i understand like working with starbucks they're kind of limited by the starbucks corporate policy although i have heard that starbucks is working on um a reusable cup share program so perhaps that will unlock that opportunity for them like different different coffee shops are going to choose different options to allow their customers to participate in reusables 
Right, that's great. And when you were, that burrito you were eating, so you said it was delivered by DoorDash? Yeah, so reusables.com um, started a pilot. And so the way it works is they had Bandita's, which is a local restaurant here, participate. And so that's where my burrito came from. But instead of getting it in a disposable single use clamshell or whatever they would normally use, um, they put it in the reusables ca container because I was part of, of the pilot. So I was pretty excited to have that happen for the first time in March. Um, and they are looking to expand. So I haven't kept track of where they are now, but hopefully um, if you want them, tell your favorite takeout restaurant about them and maybe they'll okay. be able to participate with them. <laughs> Great, it's really good. Um, so going back to the Q&A, there are some questions about the bioplastics. Um, so the question is, is the simple message that if it says compostable, don't put it in the recycling bin? otherwise do so um, yeah so this yeah so i guess probably that was a bit of a confusing slide and i always struggle to explain it in a simple way so I'm glad you asked the bottom line is if it's plastic labeled compostable or biodegradable it doesn't go in the recycling and um, i can't speak to all the programs across canada but in the lower mainland um, most of the local green bin programs do not accept um, plastics labeled compostable or biodegradable. So our message, unfortunately, is that those items go in the garbage. Oh, wow. Okay. This is, I know this is a dilemma I have with buying coffee beans because um, <laughs> the choice seems to be between truly plastic and um, these compostable ones, but if they're not they can't go in the green bin, so we just throw them out. I, yeah. Yeah. So as you probably guessed, I'm a coffee lover, and it's it's very challenging because in order to um, keep the coffee fresh, which all coffee lovers love, um, they use two materials, and um, I think most of the materials it's either plastic and metal, which you could double check with Recycle BC, but you might be able to drop it off at the depot. But if it's plastic and paper, which I've seen, then it, it's it's again something that would have to go into the the garbage because it wouldn't okay. be accepted in the program. Yeah. So it's it's challenging with coffee cups. It <laughs> so is. you can you can get them refilled at some of the local um, cafes. Um, some of them have uh, bean re refill programs. Mm -hmm. Um, but you do have to search around because they're not super popular yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, now, sorry, some of these comments are really long. Um, so someone is just talking about what they do in Europe, which is really interesting. And they say that way ahead of Canada, each household has way more special bins for different kinds of recycling materials to collect. And why is Canada so far behind? Did, do you have any sense of what the sort of global picture is with, with all of this? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'll just speak to our region because that's where I know um, all the details. And so I would say that actually Metro Vancouver is a leader globally. We have talked with communities in Europe um, and yes, yeah, some of them rival our diversion rates and have similar performance, but globally we actually have very high capture of recycling a very high participation thanks to uh, probably most of the folks listening in today that are doing the right things and putting their materials in the right spot and and i think it is a choice uh how many bins you have and there's been research done um, about for example some of our the communities just have one bin locally for containers and paper and some have paper and containers separate but what we're looking for is capturing as much materials as possible for the markets. And we are able to do that with our BC program. So I think, um, like, I'm not sure exactly the program that they um, participated in Europe. Most I, I get it all the time where someone says, oh, I uh, come from this community and it was like this there. Why is it different here? Um, and I, in order to answer that, I have to figure out, well, where are you from and what what did you participate in? <laughs> right. Okay. 
Um, all right, I just do a couple more questions. So um, someone was asking if you would be able to provide the link to the provincial legislation um, that uh, legislates that people are allowed to bring your reusable food containers. So I didn't know what is there such legislation? I thought it was sort of up to the door whether they did it or not. Um, yeah, so where I go is the BC CDC um, food. Uh, I'm looking it up right now, the BC CDC um, guidelines. Food operators. I'll try and find the link and, and post it. Here it is. Okay, so here's, I, I don't have, um, I don't have, I haven't had a chance to scroll through and find the exact clause, but it, all the rules around what businesses can and cannot do during COVID are kind of in this um, okay. BC CDC website. Um, and so they would be the best resource if we just defer to them for all of our um, all of our answers to these kind of questions. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to do a um, couple more questions. So this is it's kind of an interesting one because it's sort of more of it at a policy level. Has Metro Vancouver ever considered a residential level, so condo or apartment building workshop training approach, rather than a regional high level, something more direct and geared to residents? Sorry, could you say one more time? Yeah, so it's it's just a talking about kind of training consumers. So it, the question is whether Metro Vancouver has ever considered a residential level, like condo or apartment building workshop. Um, to uh, rather than a regional high level, something more direct and geared to residents. Right. Okay, I see that one. So um, our role has traditionally been to um, provide that high level resource, and then our member jurisdictions uh, sometimes go out to the residents directly. So, for example, when um, we, when Richmond started their Green Bin program, they had community lobby events and they were actually in all of the different buildings and so many of our members have done that work um, and we 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 don't necessarily have um, that work happening right now but that's a very interesting suggestion for us to encourage again because uh, we did it I guess quite a few years ago and, and perhaps there's a renewed need as we've had some maybe turnover in all of the buildings um, in the region. Okay, good, great. Thank you so much. So um, I, in the chat, there's just been tons of um, ideas and suggestions and people um, posing questions and stuff. And I just want to thank everybody for doing that. And I th everyone can see the chat. So I don't really need to kind of go over those. Those are really great. Um, but um, I think that kind of wraps it up. So I don't know, Celine, if you want to come back in and, and say anything. Um, but thank you so much, Karen. That was um, really uh, so nicely put presented and nice and straightforward uh, ideas that we can all easily understand and, and adopt. So Celine, Celine, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I wanted to say uh, thank you as well, Karen, for sharing those resources with us. Uh, if I may, can I ask you one more question? I know this, uh, I'm not sure if I see it in the Q&A, but this is something I've heard in a previous uh, session with you that was quite informative. It's to understand um, why is it that residents can't put their soft plastic bags in in a, in a recycling, we recycle the the hard plastics. I know it has to do with machinery potentially, but if you can explain a little bit uh, a, a bit of uh, that and the the type of recyclings we can do from our home in in our different bins, that would be great. Yeah. So luckily in BC, I see we have some Victoria contingents um, on here as well, and luckily in BC, 
the program's run by Recycle BC, and so the residential recycling is largely the same everywhere. And the reason Recycle BC asks residents to drop things like foam and bags off at um, the depot instead of in their uh, residential recycling bins is that when you add those items to the um, recycling, so first the bags, what happens is if things are inside the bags, then they can't be separated out. And then what happens is they go along a conveyor belt and then on that conveyor belt, the optical cameras identify what's what. And then once they identify what's what, they use little air jets to shoot it into the right um, container so it can be bailed and sent to the market. And so if you put your things in the plastic bags, um, they can hide things in there. Also, if you just put loose plastic bags, it can wrap around the many um, screens and different things that they use in those facilities to sort all of the materials. And so um, by you putting your bags in there, you can make recycling a lot more expensive for the recycling operators. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see we have some uh, industry industry folks in here as well saying most MRFs have a bag opener. It shouldn't be a problem. Um, I, I, I re realize that some facilities have those, but in general, it's just a lot more effective for the, for the facilities if um, the material is loose and not in the bags. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you want to recycle soft plastic bags, you Recycle BC has lists of places where you can take them? Yeah, you can um, go to Metro Vancouver Recycles or you can, like most London drugs um, accept them and a lot of grocery stores accept them. So the easiest thing to do is just bring them back or bring your own bags. Like I don't, I don't do a lot of plastic bag recycling anymore by bringing my own bags. So that's for me, the most effective approach um, is just bringing my own bags. Right, of course, yeah. Reduce, number one, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That, that's great. Super, thank you so very much, uh, uh, Lean, for hosting us oh, with the Western Library. Must appre much appreciated, and Karen, for um, sharing your expertise. And it's been great to see all the questions and all the chats with the uh, tips and tricks shared uh, amongst uh, audience members. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'll do a quick, quick close. And then if we have some more questions popping up, since we have a little bit more time, feel free to answer those afterwards, Karen. I just want to highlight again, um, next event we have June 22nd with Ocean Ambassadors Canada. Please don't miss out. I also wanted to highlight a couple campaigns we have going on um, at the moment. One is with um, old growth logging, obviously. That's something that's uh, very pertinent to BC right now. Uh, so we are meeting with MLAs. We are working with local or city councils also to put a, a, table, a motion to demand old growth logging deferral from the government. Um, it seems that there's uh, changes and announcements on a daily basis these days. We're also running a divestment campaign that we've started this year and we continue uh, with linking with media and providing support and advice where needed. And uh, most recently, we've made a formal submission to the Federal Government Environment Committee hearing for Bill C-12, which is the Climate Accountability Act in collaboration with the, the larger For Our Kids Collective. So loads going on. So if you want to stay informed to understand what we're doing, the upcoming events and the campaigns, uh, please stay in touch with uh, either our website or uh, contacting us by email. I'll post that again. And uh, it would be great to also uh, hear from everyone here. Uh, we have a, a newsletter that comes out on a regular basis where we can also keep you up to date. So uh, check out our website and uh, you can uh, sign up to stay involved that way. Great. Okay, so that Thanks. was for the quick plug. Was there anything else that came up in the in the chat or questions? Any more questions for Karen? Um, you know, I, there is one more question I could could um, ask you about, and it's: um, Is there any regulation concerning the recyclability or compostability of takeout containers? 
I often see containers made of paper lined with plastic. Is this still allowed? And if so, why when there are better alternatives like wax cardboard? Oh, that's interesting. Wax cardboard is actually a challenge for us. Um, but yes, this is something that uh, we're kind of looking at when we're looking at the um, unintended consequences of, for example, the foam bands. Like we're monitoring what's happening and how many other materials are are being put on the market that aren't foam and what their impacts are. So I don't have an answer for you right now as to whether or not those regulations are in place, because as far as I'm aware, they're not. But it's something that, you know, if we see a big rebound in other materials, it might be something that uh, will be addressed. Um, my hope is that we'll move towards more reuse and container share programs instead of more of these um, as, as the very in tune <laughs> participant pointed out, kind of e equally hard to recycle alternatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, less garbage. Um, so I just wanted to let everybody know because there, there's been so many interesting things in the chat. Um, I, this session is recorded and I will send everybody the recording link afterwards. It'll, it'll go up on the library's YouTube channel. But um, I also can share the chat with everybody at that point because I know everyone isn't seeing all the chat and then then all of those great ideas and links and things will be saved that way as well. So um, I don't know, I think that's about it. If unless um, Celine, you had anything else? No, good from my side. Thank you okay, very much. That's great. Thank you again, Karen. That was so interesting. Really appreciate it. And we're looking forward to seeing um, the campaign. I hope it's successful. Yeah, we and I and I hope that people ha, uh, have started thinking about what their super habit might be and where they want to start. Whether it's um, bringing their own mug uh, or or uh, using reusables to bring their takeaway away. I saw a comment saying that they didn't think that was allowed, but um, that that could be true because there's different health authorities for different areas. So always check with your local health authority. But um, in the Vancouver Health Authority, we've been told that that's that's okay. Um, as long as the person's bringing it to their table and just putting their own leftovers in their own container. So, okay. Anyways, lots more work to do, but thank you everyone for, for participating and for doing your part. Great. Okay. Thank you very All much. Right. Good night, everyone. See you on the 22nd. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.